Can we take a step back? You just said, um, or you just refer- referred to them as gays in the 13th century. But I mean, certainly they uh, wouldn't have conceptualized themselves as gay. So w- just in the historical context, like, what do you mean by gay? Okay, so the word gay didn't exist. Uh, modern, uh, modern epistemology of what it is to be gay didn't exist. But did they, did they have a sense that they were different from other people in society? Yes. Did they feel oppressed by that society? Yes. Did they speak out against that oppression? Yes. So it's bizarre because when you look at this Middle Eastern literature on homosexuality from the 13th century, uh, what you have is a literature that's demanding to be understood in terms far more similar to current Western epistemology of gay and lesbian sexuality then um, what the what the same li- li- literature in the West of the same period would have asked. So, you know, there is a lot of evidence. There's a huge amount of evidence that's appearing now uh, in this in this day and age to refute that idea that you know hom- sexuality in itself is just a concept, and every culture has this you, you know its own phantasm of what sexuality is. Because yes. There might be concepts of sexuality, there is of course constructs around sexuality, but that thing which sexuality describes is in itself uh, something. It is in itself something that we have had in common with each other as members of the human race, and not only just us. We have this notion of sexuality in common with lions and antelopes and, and, and insects and what have you. We unfortunately don't have too much more time, but I wanted to, um, maybe the listeners can judge the evidence for themselves if you um, had the chance to uh, discuss and maybe read a poem that you included, um, a 9th century poem from uh, al Yemeni's text. Yeah, sure. This is a poem that appears uh, in a in a book called Rashd al-Labib ila Mu'asharat al-Habib which is you know, giving advice to uh, a young male audience on, on, on you know, s- sexual phenomena uh, and there's a chapter uh, that's there about you know, uh, female homosexuality and this particular excerpt that I'm about to read takes place uh, as a repartee between two women. Uh, one, a mutaqiyah, a woman who, who is afraid of getting pregnant so she doesn't go out and doesn't have sex. Um, and a woman who is a, a suhaqiyah, a woman who has sex with, with women. So they start, they start sort of writing each other a correspondence. And the the heterosexual protagonist, you know, rejects the idea of uh, woman on woman sex. You know, it's she doesn't like it. She prefers. She gives us all these very phallic symbology, you know, praising um, you know heterosexual sex and condemning the 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 grinder uh, for for condemning heterosexual sex because she doesn't know anything about it. She says to her, "You don't know anything about heterosexual sex. How can you condemn it?" So the grinder writes back, she writes a reply, and she says, in the same sort of uh, meter and rhyme as the previous poem, and she says, but my vagina succeeds and glimmers with a cheek and a freckle, like a dot of musk swinging above the crescent, revealing a pure mouth, smiling purrs, in which there is a savory saliva instantly sweet to taste, and a fine neck as slender as the gazelle's. For what I have seen of her beauty, and oh, how much have I seen! I say glory to whomsoever moulded beauty from clay, to create a perfect creature made of beauty. I came to sip from her, and her extreme thirst is at a well. If that is prohibited, then this is not lawful. And, you know, you're quite right, Chris, in saying, you know, read this poem, because there, there are all these elements in it of, uh, you know, women's sexuality, uh, a woman's desiring another woman, not because of social constraints, but because of the very fact of, you know, her body, the very fact of uh, a vagina succeeding and glimmering with a cheek and a freckle, like a dot of musk swinging above the crescent. The dot of musk might be the clitoris, uh, the crescent, you know, uh, that in itself is, is Islamic imagery there. And and the final lines, I came to sip from her, 
and her extreme thirst is at a is at a well. So they're kind of reciprocating here. They're both uh, they're both being satiated. Uh, one who is uh, the person who is uh, receiving the or act of oral sex is being satiated, and the person who's performing it is also be having their thirst quenched. And then she says, if that is prohibited, if the quenching of my thirst, of one's thirst, is prohibited, then this is not lawful. And as you can see, that, that is a, a clear and powerful statement in relation to the prohibition of uh, female uh, sexual, relation, uh, sexual relations between women. It's saying, you know, if I'm not allowed to quench my lust, to quench my thirst for another woman, that, is, that in itself is wrong. So it's very persuasive, very evidently um, an erotic poem. Um, one can argue that it was not written uh, by women. Uh, you can question its its veracity. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, regardless of who the writer might be, it still demonstrates that there was this these these concepts of exclusivity existed for these people. Um, and, and, and that you know there was uh, there was a sense of self as being oppressed by by the majority so even from a, a little poem like this um, you know we the whole theoretical theoretically sophisticated argument that uh, there is no such thing as, as, as universalities or transcultural and transhistorical similarities uh, becomes you know uh, an absurd statement becomes just a, th a theoretical um, premise rather than something substantial. That's actually a good place to stop. I'm Samar Habib, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you so much, Chris. You're wonderful. Have fun, Pride Week. Um, I just got to say, I love Sto Stonewall. I think it's fantastic, and you know, that's we need to see something like that in the Middle East.